Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, we have foreign interference in Canadian elections and domestic interference in Canadian liberties. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. We'll be talking later on in the program with former Conservative MP Kenny Chu about interference, not just in Canada's elections, as I said in the teaser there, but also in Canada's system of government, Canada's institutions. A lot of it's coming from China, but the whole point of it is that we have vulnerabilities that could actually be exploited by any actor. So we'll talk about that later on in the show with Kenny. But I do want to talk a little bit more about Quebec's proposed tax on the unvaccinated, which is really just a backdoor way into a vaccine mandate. I played the clip in the last show. I have to play it again. Jean-Yves Duclos, the federal health minister, has said that he thinks provinces inevitably will go down the road of mandating vaccination. Take a look. First, it's a, uh, it's a view which is based on my personal understanding of what we see internationally and domestically and in my conversations with uh, my colleagues, health ministers, uh, over the last few weeks. And second, it's a decision that will be made by provinces and territories at some point, uh, whether it the, the move forward or not, that's going to be their uh, decision to make. But what we see now is that our healthcare system in Canada is fragile. Our, um, our people are tired. Um, and the only way that we know to go through COVID-19, this variant and any future variant is through vaccination, you know, PPE, uh, physical distancing, uh, tests, rapid tests, PCR tests, these are all very important tools. But what will make us move through this crisis and end it is vaccination. And I see in my own province, 50% uh, of hospitalizations now in Quebec are due to people not having been vaccinated. That's a, a burden on healthcare workers, a burden on society, which is very difficult to uh, to bear and for many people difficult to understand so that's why i'm signaling this as a as a as a as a conversation which i believe provinces and territories in support with the federal government will want to have over the next weeks and months you're going to be seeing a lot of that clip because it is such an important one. The federal government deciding that it's up to the provincial governments in this country to uh, figure out whether you should get vaccinated, not your own choice. That's basically what he's saying there. And when Quebec says, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to make you pay if you're unvaccinated. They're not mandating it because, again, they're saying, well, you still have a choice. You can choose to not get vaccinated. You just have to pay for it. But what they're doing is they're further stratifying societies. The vaccine passport was bad enough. They're saying that's nothing. Wait till you see what we're going to do next. And in Quebec, when they put this forward, if you are not vaccinated, you will have to pay extra. And how the government is rationalizing this is by saying that, well, your burden on the healthcare system is if you are unvaccinated higher than if you're vaccinated. So they're trying to basically say that you have to pay for what the government says is your increased share of the healthcare system. Now, this is where the thing will die. A lot of the criticism that this has gotten from the left, for example, NDP member of parliament, I think it was Don Davies, had said that he doesn't like that this would compromise the universality of health care in Canada. It's not, well, I think it's wrong to judge people based on their vaccination status. It's, well, we can't, we can't do anything that steps on the toes of universal health care. But hey, I'll take opposition to this however we get it. I think what the government is aiming to do is put forward a policy that seems unintrusive, that they can pretend is not intrusive, that they can pretend isn't just trampling on your right to bodily autonomy and your right as an individual to make these decisions. And they're saying, well, we're going to do it in the tax code. So that's how they're getting around the enforceability problem. This might be something that is on your income tax return. So uh, either you have to declare vaccinated or unvaccinated, or perhaps Health Quebec records Records are being sent over to Revenue Quebec, which raises a host of monumental other issues, because what happens if we start taking this actuarial approach to healthcare in general? 
You know, I was on a left-wing podcast about this. I've had great fun. I've been on the show a number of times. And we were talking about this. And I, I said, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for, because a lot of the people on the left, and, and by the way, I've seen a lot of criticism left and right of this uh, Lego tax, but if you are on the left and, and you believe in health care in this country as birthright, as so many Canadians do, be careful what you wish for, because if, if we go down the road of starting to demand that Canadians pay for their share of health care, which is basically what you're doing when you pay for something based on a, a risk criteria. If you do that, you're opening the door to a whole host of other issues in healthcare that I don't think people want to do in Canada. Bringing in that Americanized approach to healthcare that is so often resisted and rejected by Canadians. Sure, let's start changing your tax rate based on whether you smoke, whether you eat crappy food, whether you go to the gym or not, all of these other things. And, and some people will say, well, a lot of this stuff is embedded in sin taxes on tobacco. Sure, but there's no sugar tax. There's no junk food tax. In many provinces, alcohol is just taxed at the regular sales tax. There's not a special alcohol tax per se that is tied to the healthcare system. And even in Ontario, when they did have a tax that was special to liquor, and I think they do still to some extent, but it's more hidden. They were not putting it always to healthcare. It was, oh, we're, we're going to schools, we're going to roads. The, the OPSU, the union representing LC, LCBO employees, liquor store employees, was always saying that this was basically just more government revenue. So the idea that these taxes are only tied to the healthcare system is just not accurate. And let's look at, I don't cover sports at all, but let's look at someone like Novak Djokovic in Australia, a guy who was held up in some immigration detention gulag because he wasn't vaccinated, even though he had natural immunity. Novak Djokovic is, despite being unvaccinated, probably healthier and more fit than, not probably, he is healthier and more fit than most people in the world. So I would take an unvaccinated Novak Djokovic and say that he is going to be responsible for less health care expenditures if he were in a public system than a fully vaccinated person who has another lifestyle. Not, not even someone who's just, you know, like the, the opposite, but even someone who has just an average size, average health concerns and all of that stuff, average level of fitness and diet. So he's going to be less burdensome but he would still be subject to that tax. He would still be subject under the Lego idea, irrespective of how much or how little healthcare he or anyone else uses, people have to pay the tax if they're unvaccinated and they don't have to pay it if they're vaccinated. But it's a backdoor into trying to make it so that healthcare is no longer the public good that Canadians have, generally speaking, affirmed they want. Now, by the way, I, I am totally, totally for an overhaul of the healthcare system. I, I find Canadian healthcare is terrible. I find it is something that we cling to despite its shortcomings, and we deliberately, deliberately delude ourselves into thinking that it lacks the inferiority it does. Now, I, I'm not proposing replacing it with the U.S. system. There are a host of other uh, systems around the world that do better than both Canada and the United States and take less money to do it. Nevertheless, I'm saying that right now, if we're going to have that healthcare discussion, let's have it consistently. So I do think there are both left-wing and right-wing premises that can be used to defeat this legislation. My position on this is that all of these things are secondary. The most important one is that we should not be stratifying society. Government should not be using coercive measures to mandate anything along the lines of a personal health care choice, and that is up to and including vaccination. So it, it is just wrong. And, and you could talk about, well, is it equal? Is it fair? Is it reasonable? I mean, all of those are, are fine. They're, they're questions you can litigate, but they're political questions. The fundamental moral question is, does the government have a right to coerce vaccination? The answer is a resounding no. And that's a point. I mean, I, I don't know how you sell that point to people who at this stage in the pandemic don't get it. I, I mentioned on the last show, there are a lot of people who would say, well, you know, I'm fully vaccinated. What's it to me? It, it doesn't affect me. Your individual rights do affect you. And it's the same as the big frustrations about privacy rights. People who use that old trope, well, I've got nothing to hide. That doesn't matter. 
Your right to privacy is more important than individual things you might want to keep private. Your right to decide for yourself whether you want to get vaccinated is more important than what your individual choice is. The choice to do something matters more than the substance and the specifics and the details of the individual choice. And so you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to look at the bigger picture of these situations because you may agree with the outcome. You may say, yes, Quebec wants there to be more people vaccinated. Quebec is already claiming victory. Apparently, there was a, a surge in first dose appointments after they announced this tax. So they're already saying, you can see in the news coverage here, they're already saying, yeah, yay, we, we did it. So that's not victory, though. That's not success. I mean, that was like in Ontario and BC and all these other places when they put in the vaccine passport and appointments went up. The governments were saying, see, vaccine passports work. It's not something over which you can claim victory when the measure you use to coerce someone succeeds in, in exacting the behavior you were trying to coerce. Yeah, that, that's the point of coercion. We're, we're not talking about whether it's effective. We're talking about whether it's right or whether it's wrong. Going door to door with needles and just tying people down who are unvaccinated and jabbing them, that, that's a very effective way to do it. That, that's totally effective. It'll work. It'll get people vaccinated. That doesn't mean it's right. So I would caution Quebec. In fact, I would say to Quebecers outright, to the Quebec government and to Canadians wholesale here, that just because you see vaccination go up doesn't mean it's working. That's a sign of why it's not working. Because people are feeling coerced by government, people who may not have and probably at this stage wouldn't have gotten vaccinated on their own. And, and I know this may be perplexing, my position on this, because I, I stand by being pro-vaccination. But I am vehemently against mandatory vaccination, and I have zero issue reconciling those two positions. Now, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association has come out, and, and I thought they were not as fervent in their fight, in fact, against the vaccine passports. Earlier on, I, I thought they were more silent. Now, they have done some stuff and they have been speaking out a bit more, but they've come out swinging against the Quebec vaccination tax. Kara Zwiebel, who's a, a tremendous advocate for civil liberties, says of the uh, Civil Liberties Association that our charter recognizes individual autonomy over our bodies and medical decisions, allowing the government to levy fines on those who do not agree with the government's recommended medical treatment is a deeply troubling proposition to justify this kind of restriction on constitutionally protected rights. The government must provide clear and compelling evidence and demonstrate that there were no other reasonable alternatives. Now that right there is out of the, the Oaks test in the charter, basically, which is how governments defend their violations of your constitutional rights. And this is a, a legally sound, a morally sound proposition. The problem is I don't know if it's politically sound. And that's the danger here is that there are a lot of people that think what Francois Legault is doing in Quebec are hunky-dory and they'd like to see other provinces doing the same. A report in the Toronto Sun by Brian Lilly says a poll shows a majority across Canada back an anti-vax tax. It was uh, by Maru Public Opinion said that 60% of Canadians would support the concept put forward by Francois Legault. The federal health minister, of course, has said that we need to move towards mandatory vaccinations. That was ultimately the spirit in which they did this poll. They did this poll before Legault even announced it and found that 60% of Canadians were saying, yeah, 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 tax the unvaccinated. And it's amazing when, I mean, if you study political theory at all, you'll know there's this idea of consent to be governed. And it's something that political theorists agonize over, of, of how do you govern a population that has not necessarily consented to being governed because they've born, been born into a society and whatever. This, this is proof that I think a lot of that is unnecessary because people will consent to their own oppression. People will consent to a regime that tramples on their individual rights if they don't think it affects them. My goal on the show is to try to tell people who don't necessarily see that, that yeah, it does affect you. Even if the specific circumstances don't affect you, the precedent will. The precedent will. And by the way, I don't even think the precedent is that far off here, because if Francois Legault's regime is applying to three doses... It's very likely that when we come time to get our fourth doses, 
this is now there. And someone who has doses one, two, and three is facing the unvaccinated tax if they don't get the fourth dose. So even if you are triple dosed right now, this could very easily affect you if the boosters become as perennial and permanent as they're certainly feeling. I think it's in France where they're talking about boosters every four months. So triennial or triannual, I always get the two mixed up, triennial or triannual boosters in France. Uh, maybe it's just quarterly elsewhere. Who knows? Maybe it's down to monthly. That's the direction it seems like we are headed. So I feel and I fear that it is politically saleable to start throwing up all these hurdles and roadblocks and restrictions on the unvaccinated who are a minority group. I, I mentioned in my newsletter last week that government right now has no choice. Government's legitimacy is absolutely shattered. So it has no choice but to try to find a population and scapegoat it for their problems. And for Justin Trudeau, that's the unvaccinated. For Francois Legault, that's the unvaccinated. They're looking at this group and saying, well, don't look at us and our advice that was wrong and our bungled border closure and our mismatched uh, guidance and flip-flops on masks. Don't look at all that. Look at these people. Blame them. Blame them. Blame them for it. All the problems you have, all the lockdowns, it's not us. It's them. And premiers are doing this. They're saying, no, 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 we didn't lock you down. The, these people locked you. We only did it because they made us. These, these people over there are the problem. And it's working. It's working. This division in society is working. Government leaders are sowing this division, driving wedges between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated because they are trying to and succeeding at scapegoating unvaccinated people for their own public policy failings. Here's, here's my point on this. Why not just say, we believe vaccination is the way to go. We believe in the science supports that vaccination protects you. We've been telling you for two years about this. We were telling you when we were developing the vaccination, you've seen it. You've seen a year of your friends getting vaccinated. If you don't want it, that's on you. Just deal with it. Just deal with it. Why not do that? Why not do that? Why not let people make their own decisions and be held accountable for those, own, for those decisions? Now, you may say it, think it sounds like a, a callous or uncompassionate policy, but it's better than the alternative, which is government making these decisions for people. Because freedom to make decisions is also the obligation, the responsibility to deal with the consequences of those decisions. And the only way you can get rid of that responsibility and get rid of those consequences is by getting rid of the choice itself. And that's the path that government is trying to do here. And that harms every Canadian. Because all of a sudden you have no choice. You have no ability to make your own decisions. You cannot thrive as an individual. In fact, with lockdowns, a lot of people are barely surviving as individuals, let alone as a society. So what we're seeing from government now is this insistence that we're going to blame this group, yet also deny them the right to just do what they want after two years, which is the, the hallmark of being in a liberal society, that the individual is sovereign. Your body does not belong to the state. Your body belongs to you. And to go back to that polling for a moment, like I said, I, I fear that's correct. I, I fear that we are headed towards a period where most Canadians would quite easily throw their own liberties under the bus just to spite their neighbor they may not like. Doug Ford had come out and said that he's not planning to go the road of the vax tax. This is that clip. The theme is get vaxxed. No. Should we follow Premier Legault's? Well, we're, we're and, taking and we're, facts attacks. Yeah, Jamie, but no, we're, we're taking a different approach. Uh, we aren't going down that road. We're, we're going to take a different approach. But I implore, I ask, I beg every single person that's not vaccinated, please uh, protect yourself, protect your family, protect co-workers. Please get your vaccination. And you may say, OK, great. Yeah, no one else is following along with what Francois Legault is doing. But Doug Ford was also the guy who said this. Will your government provide an actual card or proof of vaccination and if not why not well I, i've never believed in in proof everyone gets their their proof when they get the vaccination you're right anything can be fraudulent right down from money to uh certifications i, I just no we aren't doing it Sim simple as that uh and uh we're, we're just going to move forward now if it's federal uh getting across the border that's up to the federal government um we'll, we'll see what they decide to do i'll be talking to the prime minister tonight but uh, the answer is no, we aren't going to do it. We aren't going to have a split society. 
And, and yeah, so he said that, and here we are. It is January 2022. The vaccine passport exists and still exists, even though it was supposed to be gone by now. So I am not relaxing and resting on my laurels when all of these politicians across the country say uh, at this particular moment in time that they don't plan on doing what Quebec is doing. They don't plan on doing what Jean-Yves Duclos is doing. I said last week, politicians need to be standing up loudly and denouncing and not just saying we're not doing it. But we are not, we are never, no one should ever do it. And if anyone does, they should resign and, and actually start putting some stakes, putting some stakes there so that if they go back on it, we can tell them, hey, you, you made a promise. I'm not optimistic of it, but that's what I would like to see emerge from this. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to conservative and former MP Kenny Chu. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. There was a story bubbling around during the last election in August and September of, of 2021 that didn't get a huge amount of national coverage. And even now, I, I would say it hasn't gotten a huge amount. More and more people are starting to talk about it. But this was a, a campaign that was taking place, a disinformation campaign against conservative candidate at the time, uh, Kenny Chu. He was seeking re-election. He had been a, a strong and vocal uh, supporter of Canada and democracy and human rights and had thus criticized the Chinese regime, which raised the ire of the Chinese regime. There were a number of messages swirling around in WeChat and elsewhere criticizing and saying things that were just patently untrue about Kenny Chu. And there were a lot of people that were raising questions, talking about whether this might have had the fingerprints of a state actor, namely China. Not just people in the Chinese diaspora talking, but, but something more orchestrated and organized that could have been taking place. Now, this is just one simple sliver of how foreign influence can take place. Misinformation, disinformation campaigns are a hallmark of foreign interference. It's part of the spy manual. If you are trying to upend a regime in another part of the world, you got to get people talking, give a movement, give an idea a life of its own, which is what happens when uh, these messages start swirling around in WeChat. And by the way, I, I ran as a candidate in 2018 in the provincial election in Ontario. I had WeChat, so I'm sure the Chinese regime had a file for me because it's a great way to connect with people who don't really use other forms of social media. The Chinese community is very conservative, very vocal. So the problem is not Chinese people. The problem is not WeChat. The problem is, is whether the Chinese diaspora and WeChat were being used by the Chinese regime or another actor to sow discord and, and whether that ultimately cost Kenny Chu, who was a, a good member of parliament, his seat. I want to talk about this in a bit more detail here because there was a, a report that came out last week in Policy Options. Researchers from McGill have found there's evidence to suggest Kenny Chu was directly targeted by foreign interference. I want to talk to the former Conservative Member of Parliament directly here. Kenny Chu joins me on the line. Kenny, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So, so let me ask you first what all of this is about, because I, I know that you were a, a conservative MP. We had a lot of concerns that people had raised right after the election that in your seat and in some other seats, it, it seemed like there was some targeted misinformation going on that we could trace back to the Chinese regime. But I mean, what's the backstory here? What's actually happened? Well, in fact, Andrew, this is not something new and this is not happening during the election, nor while I was a member of parliament. In fact, the Canadian Security Intelligence Agency, uh, as well as the uh, Parliament's uh, National Security Intelligence uh, Committee, they've been, they've been both sounding the alarm. Uh, as early as uh, more than 10 years ago in 2011, uh, CSIS uh, head uh, Richard Fadden has already tabled concerns and also mentioned that uh, China, Russia and Iran are actively uh, trying to infiltrate and also uh, impacting uh, Canada. And this is something that uh, Canadians should take note. And, and uh, the parliamentarians, the legislators should take responsibility to legislate to and safeguard our country. And that's basically the, in, the incentive behind my private member bill, Bill C-282, in the last session of Parliament. 
So that bill, C-282, it was supposed to go after these sorts of influence campaigns in, in some way. What was it actually going to achieve? What was it going to target? Right. In 1938, the United States actually uh, established something called FARA, uh, the Foreign Agents Registry Act. And in uh, 2017, the Australians did something similar. Uh, there is a little bit different. Uh, it's the Foreign Interference um, Registry. And my bill was basically modeling after the Australians and, uh, you know, in, in hoping that Canada will be able to safeguard. The, the bill itself, if you look at it, uh, Andrew, it's quite innocuous. And if you, some, some critics may actually say that it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't achieve much. And their, their criticism is actually right, because my, well, what I want is just a transparency. Uh, people who work for a uh, foreign uh, government or agent to influence our legislators, our, our member of parliament, senators, or other power uh, office, uh, they can continue to do that, to ask them to change some bills, to ask them to, ask them to grant some grants, uh, to do exactly what they want. All my bill was asking is be transparent, uh, leave it in the air under the sun, uh, it's the best in disinfectant, and it will allow uh, journalists such as yourself and True North to examine what's in the what's in the uh, deal, and therefore they will be able to let Canadians to uh, to determine whether these inf interference and influence are leg legitimate or not. So if, as you say, your bill wasn't actually going to change this, it wasn't going to stop it, it was just going to shine a light on it, is that enough? I mean, is that actually the kind of thing that would disrupt this misinformation, prevent it from taking place, and the disinformation influence and all these related issues that we're, we're really tackling here? You know, give you a, a totally hypothetical example here. Let's say the new regime in Afghanistan, they've decided to um, ask the Canadian government to remove them from the terrorist list, terrorist nations list. And therefore, they, they empower uh, some go-between, uh, some Afghans or non-Afghans, actually, or maybe just a white guy, uh, to, to connect them with the Canadian centers and member of parliaments uh, so that they can lobby these government uh, officials to remove uh, the Taliban from the terrorist list. And that would be something that uh, my private member bill would capture. And all they have to do is just register the fact that they are operating uh, under the Afghan Taliban regime, and they're lobbying uh, certain MPs or, or senators or government officials. So why is it that this bill, and, and I should, let me take a step back here. I, I don't think it was just this bill that put you on the radar if we're talking about Chinese regime interference, because I know you've been a very strong critic of uh, China's human rights abuses. You've been a, a big proponent of democracy. So th this is not just a, an isolated incident. This is part of uh, what's really been for you a, a long period of trying to push for accountability and transparency in human rights. Well, Andrew... I was a member of parliament for Canadian. I'm, I wasn't a member of parliament for the anti-Chinese Communist Party people or activists. Uh, my interest is to protect uh, my Canadian compatriots first and foremost. And then also there are Canadian core values that we believe we hold up to. And that's why as the vice chair for the uh, subcommittee of international human rights, I've been speaking up for the Rohingyas uh, you know, how they were being treated by uh, Burma and, and the Yashidis, how they were being treated by um, the, the Syrians, but also as well, you know, how uh, the Hong Kongers and the Uyghurs are being treated mm -hmm. by the, the Chinese Communist Party as well. So, yes, I, I believe in democracy. I believe in representative uh, democracy. And therefore, I'm just speaking uh, as a member of parliament, as a parliamentarian, um, you know, advocating for, for Canadian values for my constituents in Seafs and Richmond. Do you think that the the influence here that we're, we're talking about cost you your seat? Or do you think it was something that was there and there's, you know, not really a way to quantify how big an effect it had at the polling station? Um, Andrew, there are a myriads of 
uh, factors and reasons uh, how one actually lost or won a campaign. And I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm not blaming uh, it's the Chinese Communist Party that cost my seat. But in uh, in an election uh, of a very tight race of it of uh, under the pandemic when voters turnout was very low, uh, a slight change in electorate, slight influence, slight interference um, could actually make the result uh, one way or the other. And, and that's what I'm saying uh, across the country, China has realized that they could make all these fine twists and fine tune. And, and by doing that in, in many ridings across the country, they would be able to exert some sort of some power that they would not have allowed any foreign nations to have uh, in their own country. Um, they now even jail people just for talking to uh, foreigners and foreign correspondents uh, in Hong Kong and also elsewhere in, uh, in Canada uh, in China. And, and so what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, this, this, you know, this is a free land. So what we, what we as Canada and Canadian need to do is to protect our own interests, protect our country. And that's what I was hoping that uh, the bill will be able to do to let Canadians enjoy the freedom that they continue to have uh, if they decided that they, they want to act on behalf of foreign countries. And uh, these countries happen to be listed uh, by the bureaucrats, by the way, uh, as one of the nations that, that are subject to my Foreign in, uh, Influence Act. Well, then they, all they have to do is just be transparent and show it to uh, Canadians, Canadians media, uh, that they, why they are doing it, what they have done, and let the public decide and judge. Do you going back to your experience in BC? Did you feel? Did you were you aware of what was happening during the election? Were you seeing and hearing that this misinformation campaign against you was going on, and and thinking, yeah, this is this is something quite big that's taking place? I noticed something happens uh, way back uh, at the beginning of my term as a member of parliament. Uh, I was invited to uh, monitor to be part of the elections. Uh, monitoring um, mission uh, in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong being the largest um, cities outside of Canada with Canadians uh, being, you know, having 300,000 Canadian passport holders uh, residing there. I figured that an election would provide, um, you know, a political resolution to the struggles that they have in 2019. But as soon as I returned from Hong Kong, I started realizing uh, that uh, something is actually working, some powers were actually working behind the scene. And uh, their supporters uh, of ours, supporters of mine, uh, who used to, in previous election, volunteer, they start telling us that, uh, no, you're, if you support uh, these Hong Kong activists, they call it rioters, uh, then, then we're not going to support you. But a matter of fact is, I, I didn't show my support for Hong Kong activists or not. Uh, it, it's just that we, we decided, we realized that uh, the political resolution will be a, a way out for the situation in Hong Kong. But anyway, so we start losing friends. And throughout the pandemic, um, there are many, as you probably be aware, many narratives that are saying uh, China only country that are speaking up for Chinese around the world. And when facing anti-Asian racism, uh, China is doing its job and uh, advocating for all Chinese uh, in, in around the world, including Canadian Chinese. And these are the narratives. These are the operations that um, behind the scene, we know that the CCP, the United Front uh, Department are working very hard. Um, they are driving a wedge in, in Canadian society they are painting everybody um, as white supremacists, anti-Asian, and then only the CCP, only China can speak on behalf of all uh, Chinese Canadians. I reject that, I object that. Um, you know, Canadian, it's definitely uh, living in a free society. We're, e we're even, we're free. Um, this, not, this is not a, a perfect country, uh, let me be clear. Uh, racism did exist. But in a society that we're in, in 2022 now, uh, I, I, I reject the idea that uh, foreign power somehow is the only one that can advocate for uh, Canadian of any race, let alone of uh, Chinese descent. So I, I know it's difficult to quantify, but how much influence, how much of a foothold do you think China has in our politicians and in our leaders right now? 
I, I think you, you can draw on previous examples. Um, the Globe and Mail, for example, were sued by uh, on an, an Ontario minister just because of uh, setting up a report uh, outlining how he was under the influence of uh, the communist Chinese. I remember that. Yeah, it was a, quite a big story. And and there have also been incidents that tells us that uh, China is uh, exerting its power and influence in the greater Vancouver area and greater Toronto area. And in this last election, we definitely have seen how it can uh, use multi-pronged approach, very sophisticated approach to try to infiltrate and influence the thinking of Chinese, the Canadian of Chinese descent. For example, there is a social media application called WeChat. And WeChat is not, um, it's available in the Western free world, but uh, it's the only social media messaging app that is available in China that is authorized. Uh, Uyghur Chinese were in, put in jail for installing WhatsApp app uh, in their in on their cell phone so wechat is definitely something that you know authoritarian regime like china uh, would love to have control it controls um what what is posted on the social media uh, what is being discussed it allows them to track people and wechat in the last election posted articles that uh you know from anonymous sources that we have no uh, reason to there are no though there are no um uh, power for canadians to trace and hold the author, uh, the, the author to account. Um, these articles were, were spreading not just disinformation, but completely uh, false, falsified information. And these are things like, for example, portraying my private member bill, Bill C-282, as anti-Chinese, that is hating and causing uh, Chinese Canadians uh, all kinds of troubles in the future, um, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is, uh, these are these are articles and information spread in a foreign control, tightly controlled social media app. But the problem goes further in the in the Canadian airwaves, CRTC controlled airwaves, supposed to be regulated. Uh, there have been also uh, ethnic Chinese radio stations uh, that are. Um, you know, that are basically uh, censoring their own commentary uh, without, you know, reporting on, you know, what, uh, you know, MP Kenny Chu, uh, C-282 bill is, really is. So by keeping themselves silent, they they pretty much are, are helping and, and providing assistance to, to these regimes behind the scene. But then worse, uh, Andrew, is that there are also, again, locally broadcasted CRTC licensed um, radio stations of uh, uh, ethnic Chinese, um, they are helping to spread these same disinformation and false information and false accusations. Effectively, they're being used as uh, another tool by these uh, foreign actors. Well, it's no, it's such a, a huge issue, and I, I find so often it flies under the radar of, of the coverage it, it very richly needs. The Globe and Mail has been very strong on this, but uh, again, I think we need to see a lot more exposure on this. Kenny Chu, former Conservative Member of Parliament, uh, good to talk to you. Thanks for your work on this. I, I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, all the best to you. Thank you very much, Kenny Chu. That does it for us for today. We will be back with a weekend edition of the show looking at independent media in Canada. This was a lot of fun to do. It's already recorded. It was a lot of fun. You don't want to miss that. And then back next week with regular full-strength edition of The Andrew Lawton Show. So I hope we'll see you then. Thank you, God bless, and good day to you all. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.